Hello there, my name is Alan Story from Wellberg Films. We're here to talk about the election. A few minutes after 10 o'clock on the 8th of June, suddenly a, a really optimistic mood spread across this country. The exit poll was announced, and Jeremy Corbyn, a centrist social democrat, had gone from, as one commentator put it, to uh, unelectable to irrepressible. But sadly, that mood has, since the 13th of, of June, been quite darkened by what happened in West London on the Grenfell problem, where what happened was that building where people of color, Muslims, poor people lived in a bloody capitalist death trap. We don't know yet how many people have died there. And it was good to see that at least a Labour councillor, not a Labour MP, not one of my favorite people, but called for corporate manslaughter charges. And it really showed what kind of country we live in when these kinds of things happen. But back to the election. Jonathan Pye summed up the results as this. Jer Jeremy Corbyn just won an election while simultaneously losing it. Whereas Theresa May lost an election while simultaneously winning it. Let's look at the election first, and then we're going to get into some campaigning questions. So, Phil, uh, what's your perspective on the 8th of June? What lessons do you draw from the election? How exactly has supposedly Jeremy Corbyn changed the conversation? There's so many things you can take from this election, and we've only got a short amount of time, but I think one of the key lessons that Labour should take is firstly, never underestimate the power of socialist ideas. We live in a in a situation now where we've had a population that's been battered by austerity for the last seven years. And so should we really be surprised that a, a candidate, a Labour Party, comes along with a programme that says, well, let's not have this austerity anymore, let's try something else and let's hope for something better as well. So I think that is the key thing that we can take from this, the fact that once you start talking about hope, then politics can change. Okay, now, Wina, why don't you tell us what you learned. Is this your first election you voted in? Um, I'm not allowed to vote. Oh, all right, okay. <laughs> but you're, in, you're actively campaigning for Jeremy Corbyn. Yes, and um, to me this election was absolutely about um, strength and unity. It was showing us that the Labour Party, when we come together, when we campaign together, we can move mountains, or we can canvas every door in a constituency. And um, to me that was fantastic and I hope, I sincerely hope we can carry that on and um, continue for the next election which will hopefully be quite soon. Okay Mick, Mick Napier from Scotland. I think it's absolutely wonderful time because uh, the best laid plans of our rulers to keep us in our place are failing all over the place. You have to remember, I come from Scotland, the, the electoral system there was designed to specifically prevent an SNP majority, and it happened. Jeremy Corbyn was never supposed to win the leadership of the Labour Party. Uh, he was put for the, the uh, system that Miliband introduced was was to prevent a left wing candidate winning. Uh, Cameron went to a, a referendum. Uh, nobody wanted. I mean, very very few people wanted uh, wanted the, the the outcome that we got. Cameron didn't want it, but but it happened. And with this general election, uh, the best laid plans of Theresa May as well have gone completely awry. And I think if you look around the world, you see the old ways of keeping us in our places are faulting, really oh. faulting badly. Okay, so let's try it again. Anybody disagree with what Emily said there? <coughs> uh, no, I think what, going with what Mick was talking about in regards to the SNP, one of the things that I took from the SNP's breakthrough in, in just after the Scottish independence referendum was you got this general sense that there was hope in Scotland, that there's a sense that things could get better, to borrow a phrase from uh, Tony Blair's favourite song. And finally, that kind of, that hope has spread like a contagion into, into Britain as well. So now I think there are millions of people in Britain who now know what yeah. millions, a few million people felt in Scotland yeah. as well after the referendum. Good more talking about Scotland. You're a supporter of Scottish independence, right, Mick? What's that cause, what's the strength of that cause after June the 8th? Where's that going? It's weaker because uh, I was, I'm still and, I'll, and, and have been for a long time a supporter of independence. But like a lot of people, 
It's not based on nationalism. It's not based on kilts and haggis or any any hostility to folk down south. It was it was one way to escape from austerity and endless war, while the Labour Party was utterly failing to provide any alternative. Corbyn is the antidote to independence, if you like. And he spread hope across the rest of the UK, and you'll see the appetite for independence uh, becoming weaker. Uh, Sturgeon knows this, everybody knows this. And I think that's absolutely right. I remember my daughter came back from, uh, from living in, in Germany, and she travelled to meet me in a, in a small bus, and she was absolutely astonished. On a, on a Saturday night, people in Scotland were talking about, we have, we can run the health service, it was intensely politicised. And I remember there was a hen party once in a, in a restaurant and it suddenly went quiet. And a famous journalist, whom I don't like, asked the waiter why the hen party, you know, red horns, and had gone quiet. He said, they're discussing independence. Mm. It was intensely political. And I think that's now spreading across the rest of the UK. And, and the, the atrocity in London is going to make that spread even faster and harder and deeper. M Mal, you're a, uh, a young person. I'm 70, you're about 21. Um, what do you think this is meant for hope among young people? You said, you know, Corbyn changed the conversation. There's this sense of hope. You, you've been talking to your friends. Do they have hope? Absolutely. I mean, um, what we've seen with Corbyn is something that we haven't seen for quite a long time. I mean, um, it's, it's quite a common misconception that young people are perpetually not interested in politics, which is not true. Actually, up until the 90s, the gap in voting turnout between younger people and older people was really quite small. It was only since about 1992 that that started deteriorating up to the point where in 2005, less than 50%, sort 45% of, of young people actually engaged with politics. Now we're seeing an upward rise again. Now we're seeing young people turning out to vote. But not only that, we're seeing young people actively spread the you know the news of Labour spread the policies and fight not only about um, tuition fees which is very commonly thrown at us but actually about social justice for everybody. Mm. And with social justice, that's a sort of an interesting question. Let's say Jeremy Corbyn was right here in her, here at Sheffield Hallam University, and I asked him this question: What does socialism mean to you, Jeremy? How do you think he would answer that question? Phil? <laughs> you give me the hard question. <laughs> um, I think he, he, Jeremy Corbyn would answer it in terms of it being about fairness for all and justice for all and people having equal recourse and access to, uh, to, to the system. So, say for example, using uh, the, the Grenfell tragedy for instance, the people, the, the tenants groups there constantly and consistently uh, ran up against the local council, uh, tried to get involved, uh, tried to bring in lawyers that they couldn't afford to, to try and get their concerns taken seriously. So I imagine what Jeremy Corbyn would say is he would build a, a society in which those kinds of concerns and complaints would be heard and would be acted on. Is that sort of like Sweden in the 1960s? Better, because if you look at Jeremy Corbyn's programme, it's not just a programme of nationalisation program of democratisation as well. When he talks about nationalising the railways, it's, it, he's, he's looking at a, on a different model, trying to bring in passengers, trying to bring in the workers to help run the railways as well. So and he's, that is, he's saying nationalisation <coughs> under workers' control and passengers' control? Well, he's, probably, he's not using that exact slogan, but there is that democratising uh, thrust in, in the Labour Party manifesto. It's about creating economic democracy as well as political democracy. Is that the way you see it? No, I'm, I think it's going to end in tears. Uh, now, what happens before then um, is really up for grabs. But I think, you know, somebody said, he who half makes a revolution digs his own grave. And I think we're witnessing a very British revolution. It's a sea change, a molecular change in people's attitudes and awareness of what they're prepared to tolerate. And the hopelessness, there is no alternative. Tina seems to have gone. And Corbyn, to his great credit, has held out the, the possibility of change. More social justice. Eight people don't have to own as much wealth as three and a half billion people around the world. There are alternatives. But there's going to be resistance. Murdoch still owns the press, and his ilk still own the press. And the issue of popular organs, you know, real democratization, um, as opposed to the parliamentary system, which doesn't prevent us going to war, doesn't prevent us 
they didn't protect us against uh, against horrible wars and aggressions and so on. The, 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 some sort of structural change in society is essential and organs of popular power will be necessary, otherwise it will end in tears. Okay, ending in tears. Well, some people might say it would end in tears if, for example, uh, say 22, 20, 20, 22, 20, 25, Chaka Muna became head of the Labour Party. Would you still be supporting the Labour Party if someone like Chaka Muna uh, or Chris Leslie became leader of the Labour Party? Um, it's a tricky question, but yes, I would. I mean, the Labour Party is more than its leader. The Labour Party sometimes even transcends its own contemporary policies. It's about the labor movement. It's about engaging with the wider public and making sure that there is always a voice out there that will stand up for people. And even though we've had our faults in the past, I'm only hopeful that we will not repeat the same mistakes again. Um, Phil, if, if Chuck Amuna became the leader of the Labour Party, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn is now, what, 67 or something like this, won't go on forever. Maybe these young people think he'll be 85 or something. That, it won't happen, folks. Uh, if Chuck Amuna became head of the Labour Party uh, and the sort of Blairite, neoliberal, whatever he calls it, of the moderates, people like your own former person, Tristan Hum, you work for, if that crowd sort of took back in power of the Labour Party, would you keep working for them? Keep campaigning for them? I'd stay in the Labour Party, yes, because again, it's about the movement, but I cannot see at this present time how they can make a comeback. It's all about mobilizing masses of people and they keep threatening to you know recruit thousands tens of thousands of new members but it just remains at the level of talk what i will say though is whereas myself and, and, uh, and moana will be staying in the labor party if chukra Muno or any of the what i like to call the personnel managers <laughs> took over the labor party again then there would be a mass exodus and there would be a collapse in labor support <laughs> Which so I guess comes to the question that all across Europe, social democratic parties have been on serious decline. I mean, just look at what happened in France, the socialists, Francois Hollande's party, down. You know, look in, in Greece, um, look in the Netherlands. Across Europe, social democratic parties are dying like a stone. Now, one can make the argument, for example, that Corbyn, by coming onto the scene, is in fact pumped up life back into the Labour Party in a way that, for example, if Andy Burnham had been running against Theresa May, I think there would be a different uh, result. If uh, you know, if that Cooper, I'm forgetting about the names, but if a sort of a more mainstream Labour person, uh, do you think, Mick, that the Labour Party is in fact uh, sort of? Are you as optimistic as? Um, Phil is, the Labour Party can't be recaptured? I mean, at the moment, Jeremy Corbyn walks on water. Uh, Theresa May hid from people. She, well, she hid during the election debates, but she also hid in, uh, in London today or yesterday and refused to meet survivors or families of survivors. Jeremy Corbyn would be carried shoulder high. So there's undoubtedly a moment when Corbyn could achieve great things. Uh, his popular base is huge, the Labour Party is getting up towards a million members. They may be raw, they may be untested, but they're very, very huge in number. He's still surrounded by the old sharks. I mean, who can, who can fight against the Tories with Tom Watson behind you? you? You know, you really have to clear out the likes of Tom Watson and Tristram Hunt and these rascals who are just, just um, you know, committed to austerity and endless war. So that's the problem. You, you have an inner circle of, of, of Corbyn and his supporters. You have a huge number of people who wish to come to his support. But in between the two, there's this parliamentary Labour Party who have <coughs> rotten to the core in very large numbers, who took us into war and who've, uh, who, 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 who created the world that, that, that gave us Ken Loach's film, I, uh, Daniel Blake. Horrible world. Okay. A horrible world. Um, and let's just sort of end on one last question before we get into part two, which is all talking about campaigning. Um, one of the problems of the system in this country is the lack of fairness in voting. That, for example, um, the Greens, they didn't do very well in this election, uh, but they did get 525,000 votes. They only got one MP, Carolyn Lucas. Should we, in fact, be 
are arguing for a, a, a serious proportional representation so that all votes were the same. Mm -hmm. Phil? Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm personally someone who's in favour of the single transferable vote. So you keep the constituency link between members of parliament and the places that they represent, but they are elected on a more proportional basis. It's a system that the Republic of Ireland used. They seem to manage it. It's supposed to be more complex, but if they can manage it, I'm sure we can. That's not Labour Party policy. No, definitely. Because the Labour Party and the Tories are the ones that are in fact benefiting from the first past the post system. That's right. And I don't know if people think the Labour Party is going to change, but a lot of people think it's just not fair that votes in some parts are worth so much more than others. It's all this tactical voting. You don't really vote for what you're for. Do you have a view on that? As a fresh activist, I would be very interested to see more arguments from both sides. I can completely understand the proportional representation argument in enfranchising people by giving them representatives that they truly, truly want. At the same time, I can see how we would run significant risks having proportional representation when the current political climate... Well, what's the risk? Tories. Ah, oh, <laughs> the Tories and Labour are the ones who benefit from proportional representation. Uh, but look, we got to sort of end the voting, and because there's a lot more to politics than simply voting. Every two years, every five years, every year, you know, whatever. There's politics is about a lot of campaigning for causes that may not even have come up. You no, know, say if you're an environmentalist, environmentalism, except for the Greens, didn't really raise its head in the election. There's lots of other causes out there that that people want to campaign on. So what, ca what issues would you, for example, Malwina, like to campaign on? So um, after this interview, I will be going back to my Labour Party branch for an annual general meeting where I'll be um, choosing the representatives for the constituency who will then go on and elect the conference delegate. And that itself, modernizing the Labour Party, making sure that it reflects both the membership but also clearly the desire of the wider electorate to have a more left-wing country, a more socially just country. But also, I will be working specifically, because it's my niche as a youth officer, to... Um, You're the youth officer for your... Branch and constituency, right. yes. I will be working specifically to engage with young people who have been so amazing and so helpful this election, and I, I'll be working to make sure that the spirit that they've gathered this election will not go away. And how, how would you get more young people involved in politics? I think it's about making politics social and making politics enjoyable and accessible. Very often when young people start raising our voices about politics, we get talked down, we get told that, oh, you're too young to have an opinion, you have to gain some experience, some um, years onto your you know, baggage. And actually, we often keep forgetting that knowledge and wisdom doesn't necessarily come with age and experience. So. We're trying to say make it <laughs> the most eligible uh, people. Anyways, I, and what about re reducing the voting age to 16? Absolutely. Um, the youth parliament is brilliant with the campaign to reduce the voting age to 16. If we can send people to war, if we can tax them, then we can absolutely have them vote. Okay. Phil, what kind of campaigning are you going to be doing? You write a blog. Tell us more about it. What other issues are, are on your agenda? Well, there's, there's basically... I kind of I wear two hats all the time, I suppose, as a blogger and as an activist. So if I might, I'll start with the activism first. One of the things that we need to do is we need to seize this moment of, of mass radicalisation. And I think that for us to, for the labour movement to prosper, we need to turn a lot of those young activists and direct them towards the trade union movement. Because the trade union movement is the one that represents, is the movement that represents workers' interests in the workplace. And that is still the linchpin of the power of capital in Britain. The power of, of the Tories, the power of the Rupert Murdochs, the Alan Sugars and the Richard Bransons, all flows from the workplace. And unfortunately, we have just seen some statistics that have shown that trade union membership has slid by a quarter of a million over the course of the last year. Right. This cannot continue. We need, to, we need to get more young people into the trade union. And what, tell us a bit more about your blog. What do you do in that? I read it every morning at 8 o'clock or whenever it comes down the pipe. You're far too generous. No, my blog <laughs> is... Well, not every night, but <laughs> every morning. But. Even the music post. <laughs> um, my, my blog is 
because I believe that what we all need to do as activists is we all have a responsibility not just to go out and campaign, but try to understand what's happening. And now Britain is going through a massive period of political turmoil at this moment. And so what is driving this? Where is this all going? Where is all this coming from? What's happening? So it does mean reading some quite complex books, unfortunately, with some right, really difficult words but, and, and really convoluted sentence structures. But what I try and do with my blog is, because I read uh, an awful lot and I'm trying to understand what's happening all the time, is I just use my blog to, to scribble down my thoughts about what's going on and to try and offer some, some pointers, some, uh, some things for people to think about as we try and make sense of what's happening. Right. Okay, Phil? Phil, Mick, uh, what are you here? What are you going to be campaigning upon? You know, when you go back to Scotland in the next coming months, what, what's your cause? Well, the, we think the, uh, the Palestinian cause, the, the struggle of Palestinians for freedom, is the equivalent of the struggle against apartheid in South Africa in the past, or the struggle against the genocide, the killing of three million people in Indochina during the Vietnam War. It's, it's the key, it's a litmus test you know, at the moment. Theresa May intends to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration later this year. What's the Balfour Declaration? The Balfour Declaration was the decision by the British government to give Palestine to European colonization uh, after 1917, and they did so successfully. And that has led to the situation in Palestine today, and Israeli historian calls Gaza a case of incremental genocide, um, and we find that there's mass opposition, there's, there's very little support for that at a popular level, but the government and corporate Britain supports what's going on. And I think it's fantastically dangerous because ISIS and Al-Qaeda turn to people across the Muslim world and say, this is what you can expect from the West. Look at Palestine, dispossession, massacre, etc. And I think uh, not just for the people of Palestine, but for our own sake to, 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 to inhibit the recruiting sergeants of ISIS, we need to build a, a determined militant campaign of solidarity with the people of Palestine, similar to what was done with the, with the war in Vietnam. Well, it's a, it's a, I know you have a very active uh, organization up there. Uh, good luck with it all. I'm also going to speak what I'm going to be doing, what the campaigning that I'm going to be doing. Uh, I'm going to be working with my colleagues in well-read films. We've got a number of good videos in the pipeline, I hope so. We have one coming up very soon on fracking and the 1932 mass trespass in the Peak District. We've been working on that since October, so that's coming. Next, we're going to be start filming a, a little um, short feature called Meltdown, about the possible meltdown of capitalism. And uh, so we're just getting sort of getting the actors all together and we're filming that just outside the woods in Sheffield. Um, making films is a real fun collective project. I only learned starting to uh, how to do this two years ago. Um, we're always looking for, this is my plug, or our plug, we're always looking for new videographers. Just email us. It's found at the end of the, uh, the video, uh, wellreadfilms at gmail.com. We really would, could use more people. I'm also, though, an active tree campaigner in Sheffield. I live on Western Road in Sheffield. The Sheffield City Council wants to cut down 23 healthy, and I stress the word healthy trees, that were planted in 1919 by working class people in my district to sell it to sort of remember the people who had died in World War I. And it's a lovely street with lovely trees, and uh, there's no reason whatsoever to in fact cut these trees down. But Sheffield City Council is bound to determine, as they've been doing, cut down over 4,000 trees across the city. And the SCC, Sheffield City Council, is controlled by the Labour Party, is getting very vindictive. Uh, they're trying to crush those who in fact want to try and save the trees. For example, Alison Teal is a Green Party councillor, and she's also a tree campaigner. On the 9th of June, Allison got a letter from the Sheffield City Council threatening her with a disciplinary panel for breach of conduct if she did not cease campaigning. This kind of thing is in fact very worrisome. So I want to try and help any way I can. So I think we can see that there's no shortage of issues out there. There's racism, support the NHS, 
Austerity is far from over. Housing is even more so of an issue after the Grenfell disaster. There's a tax on Palestinian people. There's basic democratic rights in our society, in your activist group, in your political party. So there's lots to do. Carry on campaigning.